have with me Alex Eason, um, Vice Chair Kelly Armstrong, Andy Allen and Fra McCann. And on Starleaf we have Robin Newton and Sinead Innes. All very welcome to today, today's meeting. Um, uh, we move then on to agenda item one, which is apologies. At this stage, I haven't received any apologies from Mark, though he could possibly be joining us at some stage. I'll move on then to agenda item two, which is ter- chairperson's business. Uh, members, we were due to have a departmental briefing today on the proposals for the gambling bill. Um, as you will know, that was mentioned last week, but we've been advised now by the department that it's not in a position to brief us as yet. Um, the briefing session will follow um, and will be arranged for, for a future meeting. Um, also, members, we've been advised that the Minister is available to brief the committee on the housing statement. I think, Robin, you had asked for this last week, um, and, uh, and not just the housing executive. Now, the difficulty is with the Minister and our committee is that the executive meeting takes place on a Thursday morning. So that kind of has is a bit of a problem for anybody that has a Thursday morning committee um, to get their minister there. So what the minister has proposed is that um, she would be available from 9 a.m. next week to brief us from 9. Um, I have no difficulty with that. And we may find, actually, as we go through and our time is short, that we'll be meeting more regularly earlier. So would members be happy enough... Um, for next week that she briefs us at 9am and then housing policy officials will then make themselves available for the committee at 9.30 yeah. um, to, for any further discussions as well. Um, are members content with that, that we meet at 9 o'clock next week and invite the, mem- the minister along to brief us? Agreed. Agreed? Great. Welcome, Mark. Agreed. I see you there as well. Mark's joined Agreed. us now too. Yeah. Okay, members then. Um, are members then content with that. I think that's me finished for my draft minutes. Any comments on the, anybody wants to make on the gambling bill or anything else or we're happy enough? We, we really can't do a great deal about that so we'll just have to wait on that coming through. Okay? All right, we'll move on then to agenda item three which is the draft minutes. Members, you'll find the minutes of the 5th of November 2020 at page six of your meeting pack. Are members content with the minutes of the 5th of November 2020? Agreed. All agreed? Agreed. Great, thank you. Okay, then we'll move on to agenda item number four, and that is a briefing by the Northern Ireland Retail Consortium um, on the licensing and registration of clubs amendment bill. Members, the papers for this are at agenda are, are page nineteen of your agenda, and I don't know is Aidan in our is not there is Aidan in common in person or is he on Starleaf today? I don't see him there on our screen. Do you see it, Thomas? Is it there? No. I don't see Aidan there yet on our screen to brief us. And then the Ulster Orchestra are next, but they're not there there because we are way ahead of time here. What we could then do, if members are in agreement, we could fast forward to our um, even our uh, correspondence and stuff like that instead of leaving that. Is that okay? Sounds good. Um, Let me see, where am I? Where can I go to? Do you want to deal with the, the licensing bill, what we've just been talking Okay, about? agenda yeah. item seven. Yeah, yeah. Agenda item Okay, seven. we'll skip to there and please remind me where I am when we finish it because I've <laughs> kind of mixed up all my pages here. Okay, agenda item seven then is the licensing and registration of clubs amendment bill. Um, can I just then let members know they have been provided with the following papers a draft signposting ad at page 40. Delegated powers memorandum at page 41 and the draft motion to extend at page 48. Members have also been provided with a tabled press release in relation to the committee's call for evidence. Um, If members could then first of all turn to the draft motion to extend on page 48. Um, Members please bear with me because this is rather lengthy and I need to get it uh, read so it's it's recorded um, that we're aware of all of this. So as members know the licensing of registration and clubs amendment bill is now with us at committee stage and and as you will know there is significant pressure to have the bill process done and dusted including royal assent so that the provisions of the bill can be implemented by Easter 2021. For information, Easter next year, Easter Sunday, is the 4th of April. While we all understand the pressures that the hospitality industry is facing, we are looking at shaping licensing laws for many, many years to come and as a result of our considerations and those of the Assembly. The bill, as you know, is is about much more than Easter opening hours. The second stage will be clearly highlighted. 
the wide range of issues that we're going to have to consider. Therefore, we need to ensure that our scrutiny is detailed and comprehensive. We listen to a range of voices and we, we weigh up that evidence. That process will take a considerable period of time and there's no getting away from it and we shouldn't be distracted by an artificial deadline. We also understand that from the, from the Bill Office that in their view, even if the committee was to complete the committee stage within the 30-day time frame, it would not be guaranteed that the Bill would get royal assent by Easter 2021. Um, the timescale is very tight and neither the Department nor the Assembly control all the processes and related timings that the Bill must pass through after its final stage. In normal circumstances, the committee might consider holding extra meetings, um, but we know that that is not uh, possible at the moment um, uh, because we're not operating under normal circumstances. And due to the COVID uh, restrictions that we only have three meeting rooms, um, which committee meetings can be held um, uh, to, to be, be in accordance with the COVID regulations and starleaf availability, and that reduces our flexibility as a committee um, to hold uh, extra meetings or longer meetings. Um, for the Easter deadline, it to have been really achievable for the committee operating under the restrictions that, uh, that we are, the bill would have to be with the committee much earlier. Had we got this bill maybe in July, August, September, then that may have been possible, but we didn't. Um, I think it is crucial that we are realistic on a number of fronts. Primarily, we need to give the bill a proper and thorough scrutiny it deserves, and there have been changes to it since it was last considered in 2016. There is a wider scope now. We know that the bill will generate a lot of interest, and we will need to take evidence from a variety of different interests to ensure that we hear from everyone that might be affected by this bill. We also need to give stakeholders and the public uh, time, uh, additional time to consider their bill and respond to our call for evidence, which will, we will issue on the 16th of November, as many organisations are operating within, operating within COVID limitations. While the motion to extend committee stage until May 2021, we will, of course, make every effort to have the bill dealt with before this date, but we must allow ourselves leeway to ensure proper scrutiny in the current context of the pandemic. We have, for example, already completed our work on the pensions bill and will report well in advance of this extension. And that would be my hope um, with this extension also um, that we will not need that length of time. So can I ask members then for their views before I ask them to consider the motion? So can I ask members any views on that? I'll go to the room first, any views, Kelly? Um, Chair, to be honest, that we have so many people to see and hear from um, that we do need to have an extension for this. I think that this legislation is too important to rush. Um, there's so much in the legislation. Um, we need to be careful. This, we don't intend, we're not setting legislation for a year here. We're setting legislation that's going to be in place for, for decades to come. Um, and it's better that we do the proper scrutiny, you know. Okay. And I, I agree that we should be extending. Okay, anybody else in the room? Andy? Yeah, sure. I would just echo Kelly's comments. Um, I think under normal circumstances, we would have been under pressure to, to take this forward for Easter. And whilst it's an important aspect of the bill, uh, and, and I think all members have indicated that they would like to try to achieve that, uh, we need to be realistic, as you've pointed out, as to what we can achieve. And we are dealing with legislation that is going to have an impact um, right across the wider sector for a long time to come and, and given the background of this how long it's taken us to get to this stage it's important that we as a committee give it a, a full and thorough scrutiny uh, and give every stakeholder the opportunity to present to us and us then to consider all aspects of the bill so you know i i would be very much supportive of an extension okay thank you andy and then go to starleaf robin any comment from you are you content i think i think it's already been summed up chair by the previous two speakers any comment? Are you content? No, Chair, just to say I'm content. Um, we, we, we know we have a massive job of work in front of us and we have to be satisfied that we're content with the, the legislation that we're putting before the Assembly. Um, and we know from the last Assembly debate, the breadth and the width of the, of the, the views was staggering. So, um, as you say, hopefully we can get it done before, but we need to afford ourselves the time to give it the proper treatment. So, Thank support you. the extension. Thanks, Sinead. Mark? And are you content? Any comments? I, I, I thank you, Chair. I think I had made the point previously, and, and certainly I, 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 in the, on the assembly floor that I thought it was maybe a wee bit ambitious uh, to, to, to look for next Easter. It's important that we get this right rather than uh, rushed. 
I think it's an old saying, uh, legislate it in haste, repent at leisure. And it is important uh, that, that we aren't sitting a, a year away regretting what we did or didn't put under this massively important and long awaited legislation. Let's, let's be realistic. Uh, the industry has been waiting for this legislation for, for years and years and years, and they'd probably prefer us to take another year and get it right rather than cobble something together uh, for the sake of an artificial deadline, as you put it. Okay, thank you, Mark. Okay, if all members then I are in agreement, then can I just ask, are you all members agree, uh, content to agree the motion to ex extend? Agreed? Agreed. 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 Thank you. Then can I ask members if they're content to agree, to agree uh -huh. the signposting ad on page 40, which will be placed, be placed in the three main newspapers? Agreed? Agreed. 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 Yeah. Thank you. Then can I ask if you are content to forward the delegated powers memorandum at page 41 to the examiner of statutory rules for comment? Agreed? Agreed. agreed. All agreed. And then can I ask members if you are content with the press release sent in yesterday's table papers? Agreed. All agreed? Yeah. Okay, members, that is us then finished with that section. And I see Aidan's there, so he is. So um, then we will move back then. Agenda four. Agenda four, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, agenda item four then, members. Um, the briefing by the Northern Ireland Retail Consortium on the licensing and registration of clubs amendment bill. Members, uh, the papers for this are at page 19 of your pack. And can I uh, offer a warm welcome to Aidan Connolly? Director of the Northern Ireland Retail Consortium. Aidan, do you want to go ahead with your briefing? Good morning, uh, Chair. Good, good morning, members. I want to point out that I wasn't late. I was, he just couldn't see me. Okay. <laughs> so, it's, the dog did not eat my homework. Um, no. Uh, so I, I, it's, it's, isn't it the wonderful world of technology? I think 2020, the most used phrase is you're on mute, Aidan. Um, I, I want to briefly start with um, where we are as a, an industry as far as responsible retail of alcohol, go into some of the, the, the issues and, and, and then obviously um, I'm very keen to hear your concerns and, and, and your feedback on it. Um, we have worked hard to, to provide meaningful, tangible solutions and uh, correct safeguards and um, to prevent underage drinking as, working, as well as working with uh, communities and government at all levels to share best practice and a joined up approach to, to, to problems. There seems to be this myth or, or misconception out there that um, we don't see that there is an alcohol problem. We do. And in fact, that is why, as responsible um, retailers of, of alcohol, we have gone uh, the, the, the extra mile. Um, for us to continue delivering in Northern Ireland the way that we do, um, we must ensure that the regulation is not an unnecessary burden and it is, is, is fit for purpose. Our, our main aim in, in, in this is to continue to give um, Northern Ireland households the, the choice and affordability that, that they have. We have led the way in responsible uh, retailing of alcohol. We uh, were the first sector to introduce Challenge 25 approach to, to sales. That's where everyone, if you look under 25, if you're lucky enough to look under 25, um, you, you, your, your ID. Um, as well as that, we have set up community alcohol partnerships, um, including one in, 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 in Derry, London Derry. Um, which brings together schools, local authorities, retailers to tackle underage sales and, and uh, low-level uh, disorder. We've also been at the heart of initiatives to promote responsible um, retailing. We led the way in putting the CMO guidance on, on all our products. It's now on all own brand products in all of the major retailers. That's supported by shelf edge labelling, reinforcing the messages on unit labelling. Um, our members are big uh, contributors to, to the Drink Aware, that independent trust that coordinates campaigns um, on, on, uh, on, on drinking, uh, both as far as young people and, and, and problem drinking. And we invest heavily to ensure our compliance with um, the licensing obligations and, like I said, to operate as, as responsible retailers. Um, we've always supported targeting and applying sanctions to irresponsible retailers, but we also support um, proportionate and evidence-based uh, regulation, poorly targeted members that, that place major burdens on, on retailers, um, regardless of their approach to alcohol, will ultimately affect con consumers by reducing choice and value. It's, it's a lot like this, this COVID stuff. Um, it doesn't matter what you sell, it's how you sell it and whether or not you're selling it safely and, 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 and responsible. 
We're also uh, adhere to the Portman Group, best practice codes for packaging and promotions and the advertising standards agency codes on, on, uh, on, on our advertising. Um, basically, we need a licensing system that allows um, boards to address the consequences of uh, the adverse consequences of alcohol misuse and irresponsible sales, but allows decent and responsible operators uh, to run their business free of excessive and unnecessary uh, uh, burdens. And we welcome um, the government's better regulation aims. And, and you know, from the outset, I'd say that we're willing and more than happy to work in, in, in partnership with. If we look then at some of the um, uh, things that are that are actually mentioned here in the in, in the legislation, the proposed legislation, um, the reach, the restrictions on advertising in, in supermarkets and, and off sales, we actually don't believe that there's an evidence base for this, and we think that it'll st stifle our promotion of, of local Northern Ireland brands. Um, we haven't seen any clear evidence in, uh, in support of this proposal. Um, the licensing regime in Northern Ireland for the off trade is already restrictive and the sale and promotion of, of alcohol is uh, highly regulated and um, through both legislation and, and, and voluntary agreements and um, we think that limiting this uh, promotional material is both unnecessary and ineffective in scotland the same measures have failed to make any impact on reducing alcohol harm and but what they have done is created the anomalous position where it's legal for one retailer to advertise alcohol within the vicinity of another retailer's store and vice versa, but it's illegal for each retailer to advertise alcohol out outside the their own stores. Uh, the suggestion proposes no restrictions for alcohol producers or for pubs, many uh, who include visible external advertising of, of alcohol. Um, and we can see no reason why it would be allowed to happen in a pub car park, but not in a, in a retailer. Uh, car park. Um, any regulations that do come in, we need to learn the lessons from, from Scotland. Um, the original proposals in, in Scotland would have required retailers selling newspapers, which included alcohol advertising to sell these from the alcohol line, uh, which would have banned free and store magazines, including uh, alcohol advertising. Um, we just need a common sense uh, uh, approach to that. Um, we need clarity on what a promotion is. Um, a large proportion of the, uh, the issues faced in Scotland are around lack of clarity as to the definition of the phrase, leading to a lack of consistency in approaches from local licensing standards officers. Um, there's also a need for clarity on whether generic, unbranded signage stating that a premises sells alcohol could be counting as promote, promoting the sale of alcohol. Some of our members have convenience model stores um, which have alcohol licenses. Now, those convenience model stores um, that do hold out, uh, have licenses, need to be able to communicate to their customers where they do sell alcohol. Um, the other thing is that the proposal will have an impact on the growth of indigenous NI products, um, which we very, very heavily promote to the local uh, audience. Growing number of brewers and, and distilleries, and I know that you're going to have uh, evidence from those uh, in, the, in the coming weeks. Um, but they actually are, are sitting at, as one of the, the pillars of, of the Department of the Economy and the Department of Agriculture, uh, Agri-Food, key growth area for, for the Northern Ireland economy. So advertising local brands in a local market is a key way of expanding uh, the, the, the product. And um, so any restriction on that will, will have a, a negative, a negative knock-on effect for these producers. Um, as far as self-service concerned, I'm very glad to say that we don't oppose any prohibition uh, to self-service as long as it applies to, to vending machines rather than uh, click and collect services. One of the things that we've seen particularly over the, the COVID crisis is that people um, have wanted um, to either get deliveries or do uh, click and collect. In fact, um, one of the major retailers is doing click and collect now that they thought they would be doing in, in eight years time. Um, so we, we think the click and collect is fundamentally different uh, from a vendor machine service and uh, we hope that, that that will be recognized by both the, the committee and, and the minister. On the code of practice, um, quite simply we go above and beyond um, what the, the, the voluntary code already sets out. Um, there has never been a successful um, uh, challenge uh, to any retailer under the, 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 um, uh, the voluntary code that's there in practice. Um, and that shows, you know, that we are re responsible retailers. Um, we have serious concerns to permit a formal co approval of codes, um, quite simply because the operation of codes are not subject to executive scrutiny in the same way that licensing legislation is. Um, the 
provision would effectively delegate responsibility away from the executive and could see those codes develop to amend and, and, and extend them as they see fit with, with less consultation or, or, or scrutiny. We believe that our um, high standards um, actually surpass the measures that are laid down in the current voluntary code. And um, one of the things that we've been very keen against in, in all of the devolved assemblies and parliaments across the UK is the, that precedent setting of uh, paying for, for self-regulation. The current voluntary code has a secretariat um, governed by the, the hospitality sector to the retail sector. Um, an effective code of practice requires an in-depth understanding of the sector, it seems, to, to, to govern and can't be in competition uh, with this sector. If there was going to be a, a code, you know, they're, they're in the same way that we do have um, lots of conversations within the, the, the NIRC membership and, and, and wider retail about what best practice is, we're already, um, a lot of people are, are saying this is, oh, it's a, it's a race to the bottom. It's actually, if you look at what retailers have been doing, especially over the past five years, it's a re reach uh, and, and a race to the top. Um, what they're trying to do is, is outdo each other on, on, on uh, responsibility. We have uh, seen that not only in alcohol, but even over this past eight months over the, uh, the, the, the COVID restrictions. Um, I think it, um, any code panel must be wholly independent, including the, the Secretariat. It would not make sense for the agri-food processors to provide support to the grocery code adjudicator, um, nor that would it make sense for your committee to have clerks who are all members of, of, of one party. It, it just doesn't work. Um, also, the Secretariat uh, must be above possible reproach. Um, our members are, are commercial companies, and it must be shown that their issues are impartially protected. Loyalty schemes is uh, an interesting one. Um, we find it hard to understand any evidence um, for the policy of removing alcohol from loyalty schemes. Our understanding is that the push for this is along the lines of if you get uh, if you go in uh, to a, 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 a licensed premises and you buy a card and and, and have you know, for twenty shots or, or or that sort of thing. That's not what actually happens in in, in the. Um, uh, in the off trade in, 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 in retail. Um, we would like to bring forward a, an amendment um, that would uh, make sure that um, responsible retailers and responsible um, purchasers of alcohol uh, on the off trade are not penalised uh, for this. Um, it doesn't work with with in uh, in, in what has been said in, in, in Scotland and, and Wales. Um, they uh, have said that it there is no correlation and that they will not be bringing in something. Um, same with the Home Office official guidance. But there's a real problem here that Northern Ireland consumers could be at a disadvantage. Um, so if you take you know, the co-op membership card, Sainsbury's Nectar points, uh, even Tesco club card points, you could have the anomaly that if you go over to England, Scotland or Wales and use your loyalty card there, you can get points, but you can't here. Also, um, we have the paradoxical uh, where um, one national scheme is very, very confusing to understand. Implementing a second class loyalty scheme because someone uh, predominantly shops in an eye is nigh on impossible. It would take a couple of years to bring in and the, the, for the vast majority of retailers, it would not be uh, worth the, the, the hassle to do it and, and, and we would then end up um, losing out. Um, you know the, the amount of money that you would have to spend uh, to get the loyalty points to buy a bottle of alcohol really doesn't make sense for it to be seen as any way instigating or adding to uh, um, problem drinking. And in fact, what it does mean is that quite simply, um, people in Northern Ireland will be disadvantaged if um, they are seen uh, to have uh, not not be able to accrue points. Uh, for, 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 for loyalty cards, no matter who the retailer is. Lastly on this is just a heads up about what else is coming down the line. The uh, health minister, as you know, has stated that during this term, he's going to bring forward um, uh, legis or, sorry, a consultation on minimum unit price. And any changes to alcohol legislation must be taken into consideration with these proposals. 
we're not opposed to the principle of minimum minimum unit price in Northern Ireland, um, and I know that comes as a surprise to, to, to a lot of people. Um, we do need to make sure that there's a, a way of of, of uh, delivering it um, uh, uh, responsibly, and I just don't mean for retailers. I mean that we're not cre- creating booze cruises north and south because of a, a of a, a, a differential um, there. But the, the main point is that we will work with the uh, executive and with. Uh, the uh, Department of Health and the Minister for Health to to bring that in in, in a in a way that uh, is 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 sensible. So um, there's not really the need for an, an overt uh, belt and, and braces approach. In conclusion, just to say, I reiterate that we're very well willing to work with government at all levels um, to promote things like healthy eating and the responsible consumption of alcohol. And we have a track record that I can quite proudly stand over of what we've been doing. However, these proposals would put an unwelcome burden on both consumers and responsible retailers of alcohol for for little of of, of any return. You will have noticed that we have no objections or or, or won't even um, mention the the extension of ours and and that sort of thing, because that's for the on-trade. And we will quite quite welcome whatever the, the... uh, the minister and, and the committee put forward on that. For us, it's about making sure that responsible retailers of alcohol aren't penalised and responsible drinkers of alcohol aren't penalised. Thank you. Thank you, Aidan. Um, you're our, our first person to come in and brief us on this, so um, I'm sure we will hear a, there'll be a, a, a thread of commonality um, with some people through this, and then others will be completely the opposite opinion. Um, so it's good to get this started. Um, I just have a few a few questions and comments I want to make. Um, the first one is around the the formal codes of practice, and I know from your from what you've said there today and from your briefing you sent us that there is concerns around that. And I didn't understand the, the real concerns about that until you started explaining it to me now. Um, about uh, that the, the, there's currently the, the the voluntary code is in place. Does that voluntary code, as it stands right now, in your opinion, um, work effectively? Is it robust enough? And then also um, with the rest of the UK, I don't know whether I read it in your submission or read it somewhere else, um, uh, that this would take a, that this would be a, a different approach we are taking to the rest of the UK. Can I ask just that first, Aidan? Yeah, on the voluntary code, um, so we, we aren't actually part of the code. I um, have, uh, so none of our members actually sit on, on that, that code body. Um, I have a, a, a lot of interaction, or used to have more uh, with them. Um, there hasn't been that much lately. Um, I think that the... <sighs> The effectiveness of it has been seen as far as what it has done in irresponsible advertising and irresponsible promotions. But those have been for things like nightclubs, um, where they have been quite stringent and quite hard, where they have had to be. Um, as far, like I said, over this past uh, few years since the inception of the code, there has been no, uh, there have been complaints made. Um, but none of the complaints against the supermarkets or um, the the retailers have been uh, upheld. Um, I, I think if we were to do it if, it, if that's the way that we were going, we would sort of look at a, a separate code for, for retailers and, and that we would be trying to hold ourselves uh, to that high level that we're already uh, doing. Um, as far as the uh, approach in, in the Northern Ireland, the, the, that sort of codifying and, and, and put it on a statutory basis, yeah, as my understanding is that it would be the first in the UK uh, to do it uh, on this basis. And again, there's been little evidence to show uh, what that would, uh, what, what, what difference that, that would make. Um, the biggest thing is that we are already, you know, from Challenge 25 to uh, what we do, the work that we do with the under, uh, Advertising Standards Agency and the Portman Group, um, the standards that we have are impeccably high. Um, you got to remember, this isn't just about being able to retail alcohol. This is a reputational thing as well. So um, retailers are risk averse when it comes to their reputation and what they've always tried to do is hold themselves to, to a higher standard so um, that's one of the reasons why this approach has not been taken in England, Scotland and Wales and why we feel that it shouldn't be taken in Northern Ireland. And just briefly a supplementary on that is then I mean in your opinion you're saying that, that there's little evidence um, to show why this should be included in the bill and again it's just your opinion I'm asking here, uh, here as well um, I mean do you have a theory behind that as to why it has been included in the bill? Um, it's been something that's been asked for um, you know, by, by, by different sectors uh, over this, this past 
going back 12 years almost. Um, and I think part of it is about uh, competition. And, and that is, is, is something that, that, that happens. I think it is also um, to be seen to be, 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 be doing something. Again, the way that we work on all of this um, is uh, on an evidence base and everything has to be evidence-based decision-making. We haven't seen any, any evidence that, that this makes a, a difference, especially since uh, the high standards to which we hold ourselves are, are above uh, what the voluntary code uh, actually says. And again, that's borne out by the fact that in, in the whole lifetime of the voluntary code and the voluntary code panel, there hasn't been one successful uh, challenge to, to retailers. Okay, thanks. Thanks for answering that, Aidan. And I suppose just from a committee perspective as well, I mean, anything that we're doing here will be based on evidence that we gather as well. Um, so that's why we, we, we need to ask those more sort of or to probe a bit further into some of that question. I just want to then move on then to the loyalty schemes. When I had first heard the loyalty schemes in the bill, I, my automatic thought was actually, because I do know of, of, of a place I've been in before, where you buy a card for £10 and you get four gins and two tonic waters, you know, something like that. That's what I had thought of when I first started the loyalty. And I thought, OK, I can understand why we would do away with that. But now that you've brought the attention, the likes of the store cards, I mean, I, I know uh, we have certainly Tesco's, we have Sainsbury's Nectar Points, we have Marks and Spencer's where you get your your, your Sparks card, different things like that, um, where you maybe get um, extra if you're paying by credit card, things like, you know, so that is there. Um, you know, I now understand how difficult that would be to introduce that into Northern Ireland. Um, and also then I want to ask you about the venting machines as well, added on to that. I mean, I understand the click and collect, I think if the ID is required for click and collect, there are ways around that, um, that someone has to show ID in order to collect whatever they've ordered. Um, but the vent machines, I've never come across any vent machines in anywhere I've been. Where, where would you normally see those, Aidan? Are they in hotels or are they... The, the, they're they're in hotels uh, a, a lot of the time, um, and they're not very they're, they're not here um, very often. I, I suppose uh, they have been sort of growing uh, across UK and, and Europe um, on a small basis, um, but they they are something that you know if you've uh, gone to uh, somewhere for, for for the weekend, you find yourself at half two in the morning, you can't get a drink. Suddenly, you're able to get as much as 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 the change in your pocket allows you, or your your card allows you. If it, it, it's that, so I can understand the reasoning behind it. But it, it, the, with the with the um, with that measure, as as far as as machines and with the loyalty card, I can see the base thought behind it. However, when the le legislation was drafted. Um, it didn't take into consideration the, the wider effects, and this part of the legislative process. This is why you know we're we're here to, to I'm here to give uh, give the feedback on the vending machines. You know, it cannot stop that click and collect, especially during COVID, because it's yeah. it, that is really really important to allow people to feel safe and go and collect their groceries, removes people from store, and and it has that good effect on um the the, the loyalty card. Again, it's exactly what you said that. Um, the base level behind this, as far as my understanding, is was to remove those sort of a card for 20 shots or you buy a tenner card and it gives you three, whatever, uh, th three gins and, 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 and three tonics or whatever. Um, but the, uh, the knock-on effect is that it affects loyalty points. You know, some people need their loyalty points, should it be, you know, Nectar or, or Tesco club card points, whatever, and they use them at certain times of the year for school uniforms or, or whatever, because you get an increased uh, value when you use them uh, with their own um, w w in store. Um, but you don't get that increased value when you're when you're trying to buy alcohol. On the co-op card, um, actually, not only does it affect um, the, uh, the, the person with the card, it affects charities as well, uh, because a certain amount of, of that, uh, co-op membership card loyalty uh, scheme goes to local charities. It's 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 the way that, that it's run. Um, my sort of point on this is that this is not what the legislation or the proposed legislation was supposed to do, and the complexity of trying to have a separate scheme uh, for Northern Ireland, which essentially it would be, because the normal schemes would not, you know, the the, the amount of computer logistics that would be needed to make sure that alcohol does not get points on those schemes would render it um, uh, useless for, for Northern Ireland. And, and, you know, you could see that, that quite simply the schemes aren't available here. Yeah. 
And I suppose I, I know we, uh, Marks and Spencers is the same on their Sparks card. A percentage of what you spend goes to your nominated charity as well on that. So I do. I mean, there will be wider implications there. So I think that's something again that um, we'll have to give consideration to moving forward. I think that I, just to get on that click and collect. I mean, we, there's there's stuff in the bill to do with deliveries of alcohol. Yeah. Um, where the person uh, must be over 18 and, and show ID and all of that sort of stuff. I mean, I, I know I, my, my parents had a place in America for many years, and like I remember my mum ordering a round of drinks for her birthday one year, who was 65 at the time, and would automatically ask for her ID, um, because that's what they do in America, and we were, very, we're all very used to that when we go travelling being asked for ID, but yet we kind yeah. of think it's a bit strange here that, that well, well, somebody should that, ask that actually. ID. Well, that actually happens now. Um, when you get, if you're getting alcohol in your delivery and you are lucky enough to look under 25, um, then channels 25 kicks in and you uh, have to be uh, asked for, 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 for your ID as, as well. Um, the click and collect, if there's alcohol, there will be people uh, there. You've got to remember that the majority of them, um, people actually bring you out if there are, are lockers and there's alcohol and the people will be there as well. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's already happening here. Uh, and it's, it's, again, one of the reasons why uh, when it comes to the, the vending machines or when it comes to any sort of uh, either delivery or collection, uh, we got to make sure that we don't throw the baby out of the bathwater. Yes, it's right to stop irresponsible things, but we need still to be able for responsible retailing and, and responsible uh, consumption uh, to allow the consumers to, to do it in that way. Okay, thank you. Aidan, it's been a wee while since I've been asked for ID. Um, I'm going to, open up, I'm going to up, open up the meeting now to the members. I have Alex, Fra and then Kelly, and if other members can indicate if they want to come in. So, Alex, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, hi, Aidan, how are you? Hello, Alex. Long time no speak. I know, I'll, I'll phone you. <laughs> um, thanks for your presentation and for demonstrating the, the, the responsible attitude that you are taking with alcohol. Um, so that was good to see. Um, a few issues, just to get my teeth into a wee bit, is you mentioned um, about the promotion and advertising of materials for alcohol in maybe shopping centres or, or retail shops, and that this wasn't really having an effect on over-drinking and stuff like that. So from, from what you're saying is there's no evidence or the need for this to be included in the bill, would that be fair? Yeah, that's 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 the way that we see it, and you know, we, the the way that we have been looking at uh, looking at it is through uh, what has happened in in, in other areas, and um, for the, the biggest problem has been in in, in Scotland, um, and it's very clear that the. The Scottish uh, measures have failed to make any impact on reducing alcohol harm. They are not seen as what is reducing alcohol harm. They have, however, created the anomalous position where, you know, as I said, one retailer can advertise outside another retailer and they're fine, but they can't uh, advertise outside uh, their own uh, premises. Um, there's also uh, the thing, the, the, the anomaly as well of, um, so you can have a third party uh, who, who advertises? So one of the breweries, one of the um, uh, one of the, the drinks companies, or even one of the brands, um, who can advertise in the vicinity of stores, uh, and the retailer can can then be held uh, re responsible. So there's there's quite a few um, there's quite a few uh, anomalies, even as far as what the what the uh, the, the uh, what constitutes a, a, a promotion. There's a lack of consistency from from local licensing standards. Uh, uh, officers, um, there's the, the fact that actually really harms uh, the business model for those um, convenience uh, stores uh, that have a license and um, actually, you know, when they they, they uh, have the, the 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 alcohol to you know the, that sign to say that they, they sell alcohol and it's actually quite an important part of, of their business model. So for us, there's no evidence that it that it does uh, any good, uh, but there is evidence that it, it does actually um, do some to some harm to responsible retailers. Right. Um, just quickly, um, the loyalty cards. Uh, I'm I'm glad you brought that up because I, I hadn't thought about. The, the potential impact that if we're having a different scheme to the rest of the UK, that that could have a knock-on effect. But there's no point in having loyalty cards here because you'd have to spend millions to make us different. Different. Yeah. So um, yeah. that that was a very interesting point that you've made. So thanks for bringing that up to us. 
And I think that's me. Okay. Thank you. Thank no you. bother, Alex. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have Fra, then Kelly, then Mark. Okay, Fra. Thank you very much, <coughs> Chair. Let's say it's interesting. The big lot of what uh, needs to be asked has already been asked, and, and, and uh, they're all points. Good morning, Aidan. How are you? Imagine Good morning, Fra. A long time no see you again. That's <laughs> it. You know. And uh, I think the difficulty you have, and uh, the difficulty we have, in uh, trying to determine what's right and what's not right in the sale of alcohol and how it's done uh, poses many difficulties. I remember the last time uh, that we were looking at this, uh, the, the, it was in the middle of a rage of uh, downtown uh, nightclubs that opened the four and crazy photographs and TV. And uh, it's, it's hard to find there are people who genuinely have a fear from health reasons, for health reasons and many other reasons, that uh, there, 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 there should be restrictions. But on the same, uh, on the other hand, there are people who believe that uh, they, they, they genuinely believe that, uh, that, that finding a happy medium uh, somewhere in there that allows you uh, to think. And it's just touching on us. I know that the, 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 you hear all the time about the Scottish model and how that, that, that hasn't impacted uh, on a thing. And obviously what we need to do is uh, to, to get something that is right for here. And secondly, uh, but also take into consideration uh, other places were uh, that that uh, it, it may not have worked and may, if you take that into consideration, may keep you on a steady footing. So if you were saying to us, uh, like what hasn't worked uh, in, uh, in the past uh, and, the, the, and what in the be is the best way uh, to deal with it? Because I know that from a health perspective, uh, you talk to uh, a lot of people who believe that uh, there, there are aspects of alcohol drinking that has a huge impact on the health service. Uh, and yet, you have in other aspects, uh, the retailers and pubs and clubs and uh, places like that, who believe that what they're is, 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 is selling a product, uh, that there's a, there, there's a demand out there, and how do you do that well? I, I completely agree, and I think what we would always ask for is a tailored, proportionate, evidence-based approach to this in, in Northern Ireland. I think this is more than just uh, what retailers do. I think we need to look at the consumers of the future. There needs to be that education piece uh, about um, drinking responsibly. It wasn't around when I was at school. Um, you know, th there are some things that, that have started off. I know the good work of the PHA and, and others have been doing on this, but there is a need uh, to look at that uh, education piece. There's a need to look at those partnership approach, those alcohol, uh, community alcohol partnerships. And um, we believe that they should be rolled out more across Northern Ireland because it involves the, um, the, 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 the uh, PSNI schools, health agencies, and there is a better understanding there of how not only things work, but the particular problems in that area. You've got to remember that while we are a very small uh, place here in, in Northern Ireland, um, every town and, and, and village and city has its own different flavour and its own different problems. So that's why that community approach is, is hugely important. Then on, on minimum unit price, minimum unit price is one thing in Scotland that has been seen uh, to make a difference. And, you know, the last time I was in front of, of, of this committee uh, and we were saying that we didn't know whether unit, minimum unit price would work and we didn't um, know if we wanted it to be brought in, um, you'll notice that my tune has changed on that. And, and, and what we are saying now is that we want to work with the government, work with the Department of Health and work with the Minister to bring in minimum unit price in a way that works for retailers as well as uh, delivering on uh, those health concerns and health benefits um, that, that the, the, the Minister and the Executive uh, want to see. So it's, it's not us trying to, to you know, shoot down any idea that comes uh, on. Uh, it's us wanting to see proportionate, evidence-based response that's tailored for Northern Ireland, that has a partnership approach, and that actually gives the results that's needed. Sure, just, just as we follow up, because it's, it's uh, uh, usually what we would advise uh, uh, people in, st in other aspects of trying to, to, to make life better or worse uh, for people is come together, uh, the two opposing sides sit down and work out how you do it. But, okay, we'll create the, the legislation, but is there any uh, place where uh, that the, the retailers sit down with 
the uh, alcohol producers that sit down with uh, the, the health people that sit down with things uh, to work out because you may, you may find that there, there may be a common approach uh, in the thing because we know that uh, you're, you're not going to say ban all alcohol or you, yeah. you know that you're not going to say well give it open season and let people drink the way they want to drink but is there, does there be meetings that take place that, that allows to, to have this common approach on how you, 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 you deal with it? Unfortunately, not. Um, I do think, you know, as I've said to, to you before, that, 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 that the partnership approach is my preferred approach. And, and, and all things, you get more uh, done uh, with a cup of tea and a smile uh, than you do uh, with blasting it and, 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 uh, and, and the papers and, and slagging each other off. Um, I think there's, uh, there is a, a need for that conversation to happen more often. Um, you know, we, we already have those sort of conversations with the Department of Health once in a while. We do it on everything from alcohol to, 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 um, to food and nutrition. Um, there is a fundamental competition element to this, though, as far as on trade, off trade, even within pricing. So, you know, with the, with the, um, you, you cannot have that conversation about, about pricing. It's just, it's just the way the, the, the competition rules work. However, as far as um, joined up approach, best practice, learning from each other, um, and you know, having those sort of higher higher standards, um, that conversation is 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 severely uh, lagging. Uh, the one thing I will say to you though is, uh, it doesn't matter if you're a producer, a retailer, or or, or, or the on trade, um, it's going to be very hard to have those conversations before April of of, of next year. Quite simply, between uh, Brexit and uh, the current COVID situation, um, you know, there there is very very little bandwidth um, for. Uh, dealing with anything else, but in principle, um, as you know, I'm I'm very very happy uh, to talk to anyone about this, and I think that it does uh, make sense, especially if we're looking in the areas of uh, community alcohol partnerships, and that's not just um, with with the uh, with the the commercial side; it's with the PSNI, it's with the Department of Health, and, and it's with others who who uh, even local councils who have uh, a responsibility in this area. Okay, thank you, Fra. Kelly? Thanks very much, Chair. Hi, Aidan. How are you? Um, Hello, Kelly. Nice to speak to you again. Um, Aidan, you've mentioned there about your voluntary code. Um, can I just tease that out a little bit more? Um, because and I'll, I'll talk to you about um, sort of the perception of supermarkets and, and some of your members through the discussions that have already been had. But can you just explain to me a wee, wee bit more about what your voluntary code includes and what we should be mindful of? Um, I know you've mentioned the checks 25. What else is included within that? So we don't have... A, the voluntary code is separate to, to us. The voluntary code is the one that is run uh, by Hospitality Ulster and has the processors and... Uh, the, the, okay. That's not the process, the manufacturers and, and, and the on-trade on it. I converse with them and, and we have regular uh, regular enough contact quite simply uh, because you know some people uh, do make complaints around the uh, the off trade and, and retailers and I want to be there to, to, to help smooth things over and to, to explain the, the, the point of view as far as what the standards to which we hold ourselves to so there is uh, the Portman group at standards which our members are all signed up to which um, set how, how alcohol is sold um, we adhere to the advertising standards agency uh, code which is how you uh, obviously advertise in a responsible way and then we work on uh, challenge 25 now the challenge 25 isn't just in store it's also click and collect and, and, and delivery um, so when you put all those things uh, together um, you know we, we invest uh, hundreds of thousands every year, if not millions every year, to make sure that uh, our frontline colleagues, um, those people who have to do the, the hard work, not the talking like me, um, actually understand what um, the rules are and what our responsibility as retailers are, and they're able to put that in, in, in practice. Uh, God knows many people have been ID'd and, and they, uh, they felt they shouldn't have been, but them, them's the rules and that's the standards that, that, that we hold ourselves to. Okay, thank you. I got ID'd actually at my local supermarket recently and I was delighted. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to ask then, because there is an issue, you mentioned click and collect and, and regarding this standard that you guys have. One of the things that we've, we've heard of and, and many of us have heard anecdotal evidence about is, for instance, people phoning up, could be a taxi firm or somebody to go and buy them booze and deliver it to their house. Um, 
If, how is that prevented within your supermarkets? So if someone is uh, leaving with crates and crates of booze, they will not get it. That is that, that's quite simply the way the way that it is. Um, um, that sort of dial a drink uh, thing we have seen uh, anecdotally, we have heard of um, it actually uh, happening, especially over over lockdown, um, the, the the first uh, lockdown. Um, haven't heard anything yet uh, over this lockdown, but then again, um, you know, it, it, it's a bit too early for me to have things fed back to me. Um, and, you know, quite simply, it's illegal. They, they should not be doing that. Um, not only does it, uh, is it irresponsible retailing of alcohol, not only is it overpriced uh, uh, retailing of alcohol, but it also has a detrimental effect on, on retail, and if we're looking at a pure monetary terms. But the bigger thing for us is the reputational risk that it is, a, a, again. So, you know, we have those sort of standards to stop people from, you know, lo loading three or four trolleys and, 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 uh, and, and um, paying for them and, and, and putting them in the boot of the car for, for, for sale. That's not what we're about. And like I said, that's quite simply illegal. If this legislation, as far as deliveries, as far as uh, that irresponsible uh, retailing, if that knocks um, what's going on on the head, then it's very, very welcome. We just need to make sure that those people who are checking uh, Challenge 25, those people who are making sure um, that there is a, a, a responsible adult in the house, um, and the, the other thing is we're not making uh, deliveries at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning either. Um, so, yeah, I, I am quite uh, happy that uh, our standards are high in that area. Um, it's just now how do we prevent um, what is essentially illegal from happening. Can I just check with you then, um, are cash and carries within your membership or are they separate, a separate entity? Because I'm just thinking that there would be people going and buying bulk drink, you know, at cash and carries, who could be then going on to deliver. Is that within your membership or is that separate? It's not, not within our membership at all. Um, you know, I, I, the, the speculation is that um, in some of the areas where the drop in alcohol sales has happened, that it is because people are loading up in, in, in cash and carries and that sort of thing. Um, but I, again, I don't have the evidence uh, for that. That's, that's anecdotal. So I, I don't know, but no, they don't fall within my remit. Yeah, sorry, Chair, I've just got a couple more questions here. Um, thank you very much, Aidan, so far. Um, I'm just picking up very clearly. the the So your standards that your guys are trying to um, uphold, basically you're competing against each other for good standards. Um, my concern then would be, or my question then would be, um, the voluntary code is one that's set up by hospitality. It's a very different sector from supermarkets and, and retailers. So do you think that there should be almost like a suite of codes that are set up by each sector within um, this this consideration um, so it means then that people who know the business are trying to achieve the best possible standard within that type of sector I haven't spoken to our members in Northern Ireland uh, about uh, this particular issue um, yeah I'm, I'm glad to say that yeah we if there was one uh, in, in retail that allowed us to be in that virtuous circle and, and a, a race to the top um, then you, you wouldn't find us lacking. Um, I think you, you're absolutely right to say that uh, different uh, aspects of, 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 of the, the, the sale of alcohol have different considerations. A, a nightclub is very different from a, a, a restaurant. Um, a restaurant is very different from a, a, a supermarket, and then the supermarket is even different from that small convenience store. However, um, if it was one just for that sort of retail, um, again, we would be happy uh, to, 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 to look at that as long as it was, again, uh, proportionate and, and evidence-based. Okay, thank you. And finally then, um, of, of two sort of coming in together, and it's on the licensing side, I um, want to find out from you how you would feel about local producers competing with your um, supermarkets by selling their items from their <coughs> own place, um, mm -hmm. how you feel about that, but also... The surrender principle isn't within the bill. Um, however, I'm just thinking that supermarkets, are, as you would have heard in the previous discussions, um, get quite a hard time because they can afford to buy the very expensive licenses at the moment. Um, obviously, that pushes the prices up for those licenses. Um, and I'm just wondering, would it be 
out of order to think that um, your members would like to have better prices for those licenses. Um, and is there some sort of suggestion you can think of regarding that surrender principle? I'm not sure if we'll get it into the bill, but or, or anybody's thinking about putting it into the bill. But it's just, it is, it has come up during discussions. Yeah. So the, the surrender principle um, is something that is. Um, something of great pain <laughs> to, 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 to um, retailers um, quite simply because um, there are very few licenses about and those licenses that are uh, around sell for a couple of hundred times their, 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 their face value um, and in, in certain cases um, supermarkets have had to open with, without a license um, what, the, what the the so what the, the surrender principle actually means is that because there are less licenses, those licenses then go for several times um, their, their face value, some up to a million pounds. And people uh, have been known to open a pub or restaurant or whatever that has a license one day a year to keep that uh, license going um, because then they can, they, they can, can sell it all. Um, if there was a change in the standard principle, you would need to make sure because a lot of people hold on to these things and look at them as an investment. Even the retailers who buy them look at look at them as, as an investment for the future. So there would need to be either some sort of compensation or that sort of uh, parachute clause within uh, the legis any let change in legislation, which would allow um, you know this, a few years of, of, of for, for for the the licenses to to be sold on. Um, it's yeah, it, it's it's something of, of, of great pain, but you gotta remember that when people when the, the retailers are buying, especially if you're talking about a, a large scale supermarket, um when they're buying a license, they're buying a license so that they can uh, open a supermarket and create up to three or four hundred jobs. And in some stages that has been put back six months, a year, eighteen months, quite simply because either there's been haggling over a license or there wasn't a license uh, to to be held. Now we understand that those people who are holding on to the licenses, it is an investment for some people it's their pension, for some people it's their it's their inheritance and other people it's an egg. Um but by the same token, um it creates this narrative that uh you know supermarkets can afford the, the licenses. You know, well, the face value of the license should be the face value of the license. The fact that we're having to pay um Five hundred thousand, seven hundred and fifty thousand, a million pounds for an alcohol license is not just anomal, an anomaly. It's 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 a, a little bit perverse. Okay. okay. And what about the local producers' license uh, them selling? Yeah. Does that cause competition difficulties? Of course, it's going to cause competition. Uh, but you know what we, if you look at where we. Um, uh, at the the uh, consultation response that we put in, you know, it's it's it, it's something that we mentioned, but it's not it, it's not something that we're going to uh, die on a, in a ditch on. Um, I think the fact that um, a lot of local brands um, got their start within local uh, and and GB retailers who are here, and then opened up to a wider market across the UK shows that there is a, a symbiosis and, and that we can actually do a lot of good uh, for uh, the Northern Ireland um, uh, indigenous uh, drinks industry. Um, so of course there's going to be uh, competition, but you know what, like I said, it's, it's not something that we're going to die in a ditch on. Okay. Thank you very much, Hayden. Sorry, I'm not going to take up any more of your time, but that, that was really helpful. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Kelly. I then have Mark and Sinead. Uh, uh, Aidan, I believe that you're under a bit of time pressure. You have another Absolutely. meeting to go to, but I think we should get through it before that. That's fine. I, 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 uh, half 11 is when the other one starts. So. No problem. <laughs> All right, then I'll go to Mark and then Sinead. Mark? Thank you, Chair. Imagine my Aidan. I had that. Well, I won't keep you too late anyway, because, because any question I had written down has, has largely been taken. I thought we had made it to the surrender principle, but uh, Kelly goes on me there just at, at the last minute. In terms of uh, her, Kelly's question on the local producer's licence, uh, though I hadn't particularly thought of that, because you don't really think of small local companies rivaling commercial giants uh, like, like those that you represent, uh, Aidan, but might there be a case where if there is a local producer that is maybe extremely successful and is actually competing in some way uh, with a, a supermarket or a supermarket chain, that the, the supermarket or retailer would look at actually buying out or buying up that 
company? It's not our business. Um, you know, we are retailers. Retailers have uh, uh, high volume, very low profit margin. We don't usually buy up uh, other uh, 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 companies um, to, to do that. I, I suppose the, the only thing uh, that that sort of competition creates is a wonderful opportunity for the uh, for for the Northern Ireland uh, consumer, um, and you know it, it's it's all in, in in the sort of ebb and flow of of of, of business. So one, we're we're no strangers to competition, and secondly, it's not our business to buy up breweries. We wouldn't do it. Okay, and uh, Kelly had also spoken there about perception, and perception is, is certainly ex- extremely important. And there is a perception out there, and I'll be looking for you to, to sort of tell me how accurate or otherwise that is. And it's around supermarkets as opposed to independent or, or, or smaller off licenses. And, and that is that, you know, given the purchasing power that big companies have that they can then afford to and do. Uh, use alcohol almost as a lost leader to get people a, a, into the shop and therefore at a cheaper price than other areas. This obviously is something that causes huge frustration to the license industry. And it dates back a number of years, but I was just wondering h- how accurate that perception is. Uh, well, you're absolutely right. The perception dates back uh, uh, a number of years and... Um, I think I think you, you and I had the, this conversation the last time this was up as well, and I think my answer is the same that I'm not aware of any uh, of of the retailers who are using alcohol as as as, as a loss leader. Um, it's it's simply not what 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 they do. Um, if you look at comparative uh, prices, um, of course we're cheaper than the on trade. That's quite simply because we don't have those those, those same overheads, and it's a different business model as far as the the, the smaller off licenses um you know they're 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 competing with us on a on a a one-to-one uh level um that loss leading story unfortunately is is a myth and misperception that is uh long gone maybe 10 15 years okay and and i know we can't outlaw competition and (laughs) nor uh should we and i was interested i suppose too in terms of how yourselves have reflected I haven't seen evidence of uh, how the minimum unit pricing uh, can work, you know, if implemented as as intended. Uh, I think that, from I suppose our perspective, demonstrates that you and the industry that you represent is open to changing their mind uh, based on evidence. I think that will be important going forward. I had, like I was, like I said, intended to ask about the surrender principle. It's obvious that uh, as you're representing retail, they, they would want to see that done away with to drive down the costs of the licenses uh, that you can buy. But uh, I think even today's evidence session from you in the, the week Q&A, Aidan demonstrates that, that we're, we're in for a, a painstaking process here going uh, through this bubble. There's an awful lot to consider. and. Um, it's, it's vital that, that we get it right. So thank you for your contribution today. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, Sinead? We bring Sinead in. There we are, Sinead. Hello, Chair. Can you hear me okay? I can indeed. Go ahead. Okay, uh, th- thanks. And um, thanks very much, Aidan, for, for your time today. It's much appreciated. Um, I just want to... Um, Say so first of all, I take your point regarding the effect of, effectiveness of advertising, um, and the obviously the the evidence that we will have to consider um, of how that's been effective and or not effective as the case may be in Scotland. So that's definitely something that this committee is going to have to explore in, in a bit more detail because it's important that we learn from other other places that have gone uh, before us and try to uh, try to implement this this type of legislation ahead of us. Um, I just want I just want to make the point though that you know we have to we have to ad- admit that there is evidence that advertising is likely um, uh, uh, advertising of alcohol is likely to contribute to higher levels of drinking um, and drink related problems and there's a wealth of evidence to, to support that claim. I I know that you didn't imply that that's not the case, but I just want to I just want to make that point very clearly that we have to be very cognizant from a public health point of view that there is sufficient evidence to say that. The advertising of alcohol um, can contribute to to those who are already experiencing 
a drink related problem that can exacerbate those problems so it's not that we want to stop people who are um who are who can drink responsibly and um, but we just have to be mindful from a public health point of view as well that we have a responsibility to those people who are struggling with a with a, a problem in that area i just wanted to make the point if, if you actually look at the legislation it, it says in terms of the um in terms of the the advertising actually uh, within premises it, the, the, the legislation actually, actually states that um, it would only restrict the advertising of drinks, promotions in supermarkets to the area in which the intoxicating liquor is actually displayed. So it's not a case that there's an outright ban on being able to promote you know, the likes of the local producers. Which is very important because that's very often that's the only uh, the only time uh, they build up a relationship with a local supermarket, for example, that they can actually sell their sell their wares. So, of course, nobody wants to put put a halt to that. So it's just to make the point that that you know once you're so if you're going to the supermarket and your intention is to buy alcohol, you know that's what you're going there for. Once you're in that area within that supermarket or wherever it may be where the alcohol has actually been displayed. You know that that supermarket can advertise. They can say, "Look, we have more in Mountain Brewery here. We have their new range, and it's on it's on offer." So that would be permitted. So it's just to get your take on that, um, Aidan. Is that you know that that's is that something that you you guys could live with, uh, the people that you represent, or you know is that something that you would want us to consider more fully? Uh, so on, on your first point, as far as the evidence, again. We're happy with anything as long as it's proportionate and, uh, and evidence-based uh, pr- response. Um, I suppose on the advertising point itself, uh, you're absolutely right of where it says that it, it should be done. Um, but I'm also aware, and one of the reasons that I flagged it to is that you're going to be hearing a lot more evidence over the next few uh, weeks and, and months on this, and there will be some people who will want to push that advertising uh, as, as uh, ban as, as, as far as, as possible. Now, where it's displayed causes um if you for example take into account co-op uh, or uh henderson's or, or, or musgraves who are members of ours and they have small convenience models basically you've got one point part of the 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 shop and um, that has that sort of advertising and um, would that would be allowed um, and that then um <sighs> If that's at the back of the shop, then it's very hard for them to show that they have alcohol or what sort of promotion that they have on. If you then allow it for the convenience model, but don't allow it for the bigger guys, what happens then is you have a, an imbalance of uh, competition. Um, and uh, it then, you know, you're, you're getting into the sort of uh, challenges on, on the, the, the legality of it under uh, competition law and, and the way that it works. So for, for us... Um, if it is done in a responsible manner, you got to remember that this isn't uh, a big poster outside saying uh, 10 shots, uh, 90 pH. Um, this is, you know, coming up to Christmas, do you want to get, uh, you know, uh, a bottle of wine for our, you know, bottle of San Emiliano, whatever your tipple is, uh, you know, more Mountain Brew, as you mentioned, good plug. Um, if, if that, that's the sort of advertising that, 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 that we're talking about. And I think even if you look how advertising has changed, at what the Portman Group has been doing and what the Advertising Standards Agency Code has, has been doing over this past few years, you'll see that there is a definite move away from the bargain basement look at this to the this is what we have on offer isn't this wonderfully uh, wonderful quality and and that's where we, we sort of are so I, again it's that proportionate evidence-based uh, response but also factoring in what the actual economic and competition impact will be of anything that that is decided okay no that's that's fair enough i just wanted to get your take on that just to say if there was if it was a compromise or if it was something that we we, we need to scrutinize further or it was, was going to cause uh, the people you represent um problems so no that's that's fair enough thanks very much Aidan. thank you okay thank you Sinead. okay Aidan, there are no other members that want to ask any questions can i thank you for coming in and briefing us today as i said you are our first one to come in and brief us and you've already raised um, many issues that we we need to explore further and challenge um, especially the, the kelly that did it with cash and carries as well because that is a big issue you know i don't think i, I know certainly as a belfast mla um, we, the dogs in the street know where you can go to somebody's garage to buy whatever it is you need to buy yeah. and that does happen on a regular basis so um, it has you, you've, you've opened up more, more questions than answers for us here as well which is good, so thank you Ian. good to talk to you Thank you for your time Chair, thank, thank you, you. committee members
You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, members, welcome back um, to the meeting again. We're at now at agenda item six, which is a briefing from the Ulster Orchestra on the impact of COVID-19 in the arts sector. Members, you'll find this paper agenda item at page 27 of your meeting pack. Um, can I welcome Richard Wigley and Lucy McCullough? Um, you are both very welcome to here today. I know that you were one of those organisations that wrote to us quite early on in the pandemic, and, uh, it, the, and we're finally getting around um, to hearing from your briefing. So really looking forward to see maybe as well that, that what has changed between March and, and now, and have things got worse or have things got better. So can I just hand over to yourselves then to, to do your presentation? Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting us today. Uh, we remain grateful to the then DECAL, uh, who supported five years ago the orchestra with a one-off grant of 500,000. This prompted the orchestra to become highly responsive, collaborative and flexible. These changes, as my colleague Lucy McCullough will outline later, led not only to a deeper commitment across society, but to a previously unimaginable internal culture change that underpins our three-phase approach to COVID. No other orchestra in the UK has come close to achieving what we have achieved since lockdown began in March. We have been in our phase two, you might have noted from your paper, our phase two since August, with a powerful residency in the Waterfront Hall, developing content for the BBC and for the people of Northern Ireland. The Waterfront has become the home for the orchestra and reminds me yet again that orchestras do very well when they are settled in their space. Unsatisfactorily, we are normally itinerant, dropping into the Ulster Hall for concert nights. It would be a fundamental boost to the orchestra to have a permanent home. We have increasingly employed freelance musicians subject to our strict COVID protocols. We recognise their plight and wish to contribute as best we can by providing paid work. Our internationally outstanding chief conductor, Daniela Rustioni, represents a major coup for Northern Ireland, and we're delighted that he has spent so much time with us during recent months. He is a gift to all of us in Northern Ireland and one to be tre treasured. One example from phase two is our project, Your Song Now, Nine songs written during lockdown from across Northern Ireland. The songwriters, mostly new to songwriting and aged 16 to 17, were mentored by Duke Special Kit Philippa and Paul Camp. Paul orchestrated all of the songs and the extraordinary recorded results will be released before Christmas. This wouldn't have been possible without the residency in the Waterfront Hall. Phase one, you may recall, was our UO Let's Play at Home initiative with over 100 short videos. Phase three was planned to be the return to public concerts with a distanced audience, now delayed. We would be grateful for any guidance the committee can offer about the timetable for a return to live audiences. We have developed our digital, digital future strategy as a phase 2A, if you like, to reach across Northern Ireland in the seven ways described in the paper before you. We are grateful to DFC and the Arts Council for provision of 262,000 this year to support our reopening plans. This, alongside 200,000 of furlough support, gives us hope that when we are striving to balance our budget for the year. We are rely additionally on about 360,000 annually from the orchestra tax relief, which is dependent on having live audiences. As we sit here, there isn't yet clarity on whether this money will be available to us without those audiences. Any support from the committee to clarify the situation would be very welcome. Lucy McCullough, Director of Learning and Community Engagement, will now talk to you about the ambition and scale of our outreach programme. Go ahead, Hello. Go ahead. Hello. Can you all hear me okay? We can yes. indeed. Go ahead. Great. So, yes, we believe that every part of Northern Ireland deserves to experience their orchestra. So since 2016, we have been developing partnerships with communities across the region, working to create bespoke opportunities for everybody to experience the joy of orchestral music, working directly with community, voluntary and art sector organisations. That means that we can adhere to best practice in reaching and engaging people from all backgrounds, including older people, people with additional needs, children from disadvantaged backgrounds and communities at risk of social exclusion. We have a long list of organisations that we work with, um, and just some of them are AGNI, Autism NI, the NOW Group, the Alzheimer's Society, the Belfast Trust, Community Arts Partnership, the Flax Trust and Women's Aid. That means that while COVID has often had a major impact on the work that we do we have had a strong basis from which to consult collaborate and move quickly to respond to people's changing needs 
As Richard mentioned earlier, since 2016, the way we work has changed and now all musicians deliver learning and community engagement work within their contract. The only UK symphony orchestra to work in this way. Our musicians have established new relationships across the region and recent and ongoing activity includes our Northwest Schools project with five schools in Derry, Londonderry, primary schools concerts in Belfast, Derry, Newry, Enniskillen, Ballymena and Oma last year for over 3,000 children with adopted player workshops being held before and after the concerts to encourage attendance by schools from the most deprived boards. Our move to the music project which alleviates loneliness by providing tickets, transport and a nice cup of tea for isolated older people to attend regional concerts and musicians on call workshops which pre-COVID were delivered to care homes and day centres across Belfast and in areas including Port Stewart, Castlewell and Donoghadee, Newton Ours and Downpatrick. Tea dances for older people which last year were oversubscribed hugely and we also worked with the Alzheimer's Society to develop an accessible tea dance for people with dementia and their carers. Storytelling and narrative, they're such a fundamental part of the culture in Northern Ireland and so developing long-term relationships with groups and individuals has resulted in a, a really amazing range of powerful work which reflect the diversity of the people involved such as a long-running composition and awareness raising project with service users from Women's Aid, a project with Derry's Nerve Centre which saw music specially composed to accompany the memoirs of local author Tony Doherty, a creative writing and music project exploring memories with the West Belfast Women's Group and a storytelling project with young men from Hyde Bankwood College. Our flagship Crescendo project works with four schools in North and West Belfast to improve outcomes for children through music and it has been developed by community partners Colin Neighbourhood Partnership and Chankill Children's Zone. Crescendo currently enables 735 children to develop their musical skills, confidence and social and emotional learning through workshops delivered by freelance and Ulster Orchestra musicians with a full orchestra performance every year. Each academic year, the aim is to bring a new cohort into the project with the aim of engaging 1,035 pupils by um, 2023. As well as the Crescendo project, we work in partnership with schools, agencies and emerging musicians to create opportunities for young people at all stages of their musical journey, including partnering with the Education Authority Music Service to inspire and develop young musicians at all, from all, of all ages and backgrounds and our professional experience scheme for emerging professional musicians who are from or resident in Northern Ireland. We have residency and ongoing projects with Bloomfield Collegiate School, Botanic Primary School, Queen's University Belfast and an emerging partnership with Ulster University. We are committed to providing accessible opportunities for people with additional needs and have a residency in Torbank Special Education Elite School in Dundonald and an ongoing relationship with Sierra SEN School in Lurgan. We also deliver relaxed performances for people with additional needs and their families and we're one of the few orchestras to perform these concerts as a full ensemble and not a smaller group. Partnering with the NOW Group and Autism and I allowed us to offer families a safe, friendly space to enjoy music together and in some cases for the first time ever as a family. Although our partner organisations and schools, they're all facing, as you can imagine, unprecedented challenges in reopening or resuming their activities. But of the 108 workshops cancelled between March and June this year, every school and community group committed to participating in online or other formats so that the opportunity to access music wasn't lost. In terms of our digital engagement, obviously very important now, um, planning is an ongoing for a digital only programme to replace our season and pops concerts from January 2021. Our online audience um, reacted really positively to the more intimate access that our UO Let's Play at Home online series offered and we seek to carry that feeling into our digital sequence of concerts with more interactivity. Um, we also plan to exploit the increased local, national and international reach afforded by online activity that isn't possible with live concerts. We've been consulting with our partner organisations and SEN schools to develop an online relaxed performance, so keep a lookout 
for that because it'll be going out um, during Autism Awareness Week in March 2021. Our online schools concerts are being devised in partnership with the EA Music Service and it will focus on the five pathways to wellbeing and that's in response to demand from the teachers that we work with. The orchestra has established a digital working group to steer plans for its online activity and a key strand is digital wellbeing to include yoga and music collaborations. The COVID situation has highlighted how many people have limited or no access to online activity. So awareness of this is underpinning all of our revised plans. And for example, Move to the Music participants in care homes with no online access, they will be sent DVDs of specially recorded Ulster Orchestra season and tea dance content. And where necessary, we're actually going to be sending DVD players to people who, because we're hearing that, that some people have no way of accessing any content. Um, and an upcoming community arts partnership series of projects uh, that will be working with groups at risk of social and geographical isolation. So there, all of that activity is going to be delivered outdoors or via DVD because so many groups don't have internet. So in summary, we believe that by working with communities, agencies and other arts organisations, we can contribute to key areas across the draft programme for government. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy, and thank you, Richard. Um, I'm, I'm delighted that you've been able to come in today because I know then when you mention the Ulster Orchestra, many people just automatically think of concerts or recitals, mm -hmm. but they actually don't get to hear or to, or to find out about all of the other work um, that you've explained there, Lucy, amongst all of those various charities um, and the voluntary sector groups, which is, which is just amazing. It's phenomenal. Um, that the work that you have been doing there, and I was going to ask you how that has been um, during, you know, sort of from March to now, and I think you've answered it partly there, Lucy, that you have tried to continue with what you can continue, and and, yeah. and move to a different way of doing things. Um, other than that, and also the the Your Song Now, very interested in that as well. That would be maybe good if the committee could get the the links. Um, to be able to go on and view that as well. I've heard you mention Duke Special, an absolute favourite of mine. I've been to see him in concert, I think, about five times. So I would be, <laughs> I'm quite eager um, to get a listen to that. That would be, that would be very that. good. Um, I suppose just then, just to ask you then, um, we, we know, and uh, Richard, you brought it up there about the, the safe opening again um, for audiences. And that is, a, that is a common thread that has gone through all of our, any briefing we've had with anybody um, within the arts sector. And, uh, you know, I suppose the answer to that is we don't know. Um, but I know that you had mentioned there in uh, your goal to begin with those smaller audi audiences of 20 to 30 people. Just to ask, you know, financially, is that viable to do that? And then also around your, your digital packages again and financially again, um, again, is that viable? And also then just, I suppose, the finance of the orchestra, the orchestra in general and the amount of, of grant funding and other funding that you may have received. Um, you know, uh, how is, how, what state are, are you in at this stage? And, uh, you know, have you been able to manage to generate much income um, during this period as well? Um, thank you for that. And the answer to that question, no, not at all, but as you... As you would expect, um, yeah, it's very interesting because uh, the orchestra runs on a budget uh, of around 4.8 million a year, and that's about half what a regional orchestra across the UK would normally operate on. So we have been, become very good at operating on a shoestring. So the idea of putting on events that uh, have only 20 or 30 people coming to begin the process, or if we don't get a huge take up in digital, oh, I think we probably will. Uh, we still are prepared to uh, find the resources to make that happen. We've become exceptionally good at making our resources go a very long way. So having the residential in the waterfront hall allows us to bring those 20 or 30 people in without any great additional cost. So having that already uh, built in, our relationship with the BBC is hugely beneficial. They cover some of our hall costs as well. So all in all, we just do very well with small amounts of money. We're just very good at making it work for us. Okay. Uh, Lucy, do you want to make any comment on the other points about how you are managing through this to deliver your programmes? Yes, yeah, so as I, as I mentioned, um, the fact that we've had a good number of years to really work and establish um, partnerships with communities because we have that amazing resource of having all 
musicians available to us to deliver outreach activity. That has meant that when the unthinkable happened in March, um, we had all these established relationships and were able to talk to people, find out their needs and then um, work with them to come up with new ways of working. So uh, recent and then planned activity includes Crescendo. That big, big project is now being delivered online through pre-recorded videos currently because we're finding that the schools don't necessarily have the resources to support live streaming which would be our preferred option because all the children just adore their facilitators like they've had you know three four years of building up relationships and um so missing that you know in the moment live um experience is, is would be something that live streaming could re could really help with so we're looking to support uh, to try and get funding for for schools so that they can support that and um, we delivered outdoor performances when the weather allowed us to in car homes so that was kind of a an offshoot of the move to the most music project because obviously car homes were having the most horrendous time um, and responded really well to uh, us sending out small ensembles of musicians completely risk yeah. assessed uh, performing outside in, in uh, open areas and the residents then were able to watch from upstairs windows or when the weather was good sit, sit outside and uh, the feedback was just that it was a moment of joy not just for the residents but for the staff who are, were obviously having a really really dreadful time. Um, I mentioned DVDs. Who who would have thought a year ago that the DVD, humble as it is, would be so so important? But we're finding from talking to all you know, different other or delivery organisations, a lot a lot of them are finding that um, pre-recording workshops with facilitators and, and musicians, putting that on DVD and um, sending it out to people is is allowing groups and individuals to access content in it in a way that. You just can't if you don't have either online uh, internet access or um, access to a device at home. So in terms of looking into the future, there are there's the minor, you know, silver lining and when you're thinking of online activity, for example, we've been recording full orchestra performances in um in the waterfront that are then being sent out to schools and communities uh, in a way that you know would be really difficult in terms of getting all the, the full orchestra on a bus and sending them up the road is a lot, an awful lot more difficult um, to, whereas we can reach loads of people this way through online activity. Okay, thanks a lot, Lucy. And I suppose, I mean, it, we, we've seen it over the last six, seven months where music and musicians has brought about, right across the world, it's brought about healing for people, it's brought about serenity and calmness. And, you know, and I, I, I absolutely love this, up, this equality of opportunity um, that you're promoting, I know certainly going back uh, to my childhood, um, you know that the even the very thought of of becoming involved with the Ulster Orchestra would have been unheard of. Um, so I, I just love that now where that is being taken out um, to to people locally and said, you know that you can do this too if if this is something you can work hard at and become extremely good at you, you there's an opportunity here so well done i really do i, I commend <coughs> you for that absolutely that that's so good to hear and you know i just want to then uh, go on then richard you had mentioned about the orchestra tax relief i think mm. earlier on um and the current situation there um i just want to ask have you had any discussions with hmrc and given the fact that you don't have any audiences um, do you see that becoming a problem? Because I know the committee will be more than happy to uh, make contact with whoever they need to to assist on that. I would be grateful for that. We, we do it through our industry body, the Association of British Orchestras. The particular challenge that we have in Northern Ireland and Scotland is that we weren't ever allowed to bring audiences back in, whereas in England, for a period of time, they could. So I think it's become kind of forgotten that Northern Ireland and Scotland have a particular issue. So I would be really grateful for this to be raised at any level you think is possible. Okay, Richard, I, I think that the committee will agree that that's absolutely, we can help with that. I'm going to open it up to members. I have Fra, then Kelly, then Mark. So I'm going to go to Fra first. Sure, thank you. And we'd like to thank you for coming to, uh, along this morning uh, for, the, for the presentation. I have to say many, many years ago in Belfast City Council, you know, the, the, the person that uh, opened my eyes to uh, the, the orchestras was Tom Hartley, 
and oh, uh, Tom had played a, a major role at that time in Trending. And I think it was over, usually as were Tom, an argument over funding. And I think both uh, the orchestra and Tom threw challenges down to each other. And uh, I think people still live and remember the wonderful concert Helen Clannard Monastery. Uh, and and, and the thing that, that, uh, that people still talk about it were fond memories in old town where I lived, down in Divis, you know, that's St Peter's Cathedral. But I think one of the challenges he threw down at that time was uh, how you communicate and how you work with local people. <coughs> you offer a different type of music that they had never been open to. And I think that's something that uh, Paul has been talking about. Been talking about and I think, and especially in the times that we're in, that is a crucial thing. Because uh, music, uh, and, uh, regardless of what calibre or what type of music, uh, speaks to people. And, uh, and I, uh, not far from where I live, uh, there's uh, a relatively new uh, building, and it's for uh, the people that have uh, slight dementia or d d dementia. And, uh, and you talk to people, and they were talking about uh, that how much music brings things back to them and brings life back to them. And, and uh, I think it's I think it's, it's things like that that we need to encourage people uh, to tap into. And I think or the orchestras uh, would uh, play 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 a role in that. And certainly, if there's anything uh, that 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 we can do, and I remember. Uh, the first time hearing that uh, the or Ulster Orchestra was going into the Divis Community Centre, and I said to myself, "My God, <laughs> you know, <laughs> there was probably a roller just going at the night before." So you, <laughs> you were, uh, you, yeah, and I went down, and people loved it. You know, it's, uh, there were like small breakout sessions on uh, on instruments that many people had not heard of, or or thing, and, and it brings people around uh, uh, different aspects of. Uh, 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 an orchestra, but I do think that uh, that uh, this is the the, the, the time because I, I know many of the cathedrals and churches uh, are going through the same difficulties, and, and that uh, that the orchestra has so much to offer, uh, as well as obviously other uh, music. But if there's anything that we can we can do, uh, we we certainly would. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fra. Um, Kelly. Thank you very much, folks. Um, do you know what uh, the chair has asked, or has asked you the question about the HMRC issue, which is something certainly that we can ask questions about? Um, I'm very interested in your evidence that you've given today about the lack of access um, to online by many community groups, um, and it's something that has come up, as we all know. You know the the terms "we're on Zoom," "you're on mute." You know it's become mm -hmm. part of of common speak now, but. I was just wondering if you have evidence of the number of community organisations or venues that you're trying to share online performances with um, that don't have digital access, it would be very, very useful if that evidence could be passed on to the Department of the Economy. And the reason why I'm saying that is we do have the digital rollout happening at the moment and it is attempting to reach out to homes. But if we're finding that those, especially th places like care homes and other places that mm -hmm. are being excluded and not able to access your services, they're not then able to access other services as well. So it might be useful um, if, if you do have evidence to pass that on to the Department of the Economy. Mm -hmm. um, I was looking at the questions that you have back. Um, music, as with all you know, parts of the arts, is something that enriches our lives and enriches local communities. Um, and while, as others have said, you know, an orchestra may well Im immediately invoke, you know, a fancy concert and people wearing their black and white, you know, it's not, it's more than that. And I know from my own area, Portico has had some fantastic, mm -hmm. um, you know, pieces have been played there and we can't wait to get back to see that again um, and to hear it again. But I'm just wondering, um, the... You've talked about your loss of income and the impact that it has on yourselves. I'm, I'm assuming that there has been some savings. Are some of your, your staff on furlough currently or, or you, have you been able to work throughout this process because you're doing so much online? Yeah, I think there, thank you for that. I think there are two parts to the answer, if I may. One is uh, we were able to access some furlough because in our Arts Council grant document, it specifically stipulates a certain number of musicians and part of my salary are covered uh, by that grant and therefore would have, would, have kept, would have been double counting if we'd put those people forward for further. So 
in a limited way, we were able to go to further. But actually, for me, there was a slightly bigger issue. And I had a lot of uh, really painful discussions with uh, CEOs of other orchestras who effectively put their orchestras into the deep freeze. And I thought that was wrong. I think we should do our absolute most to bring the orchestra to life in these difficult times. And that for me meant the more that we could keep musicians working and the more musicians we could keep working, the absolute better. So those two things working together meant that we've, we've tried to do the maximum. Absolutely, I agree with you. Um, my concern has been throughout this whole pandemic is the loss of people from our arts who are having to go to work other places and what we need now is something to uplift society, not something you not to take away from from our culture and arts. Um, and that's I'm just actually wondering, have you found that that some of your um, very skilled people are now moving away from the industry to have to take work elsewhere? We, we don't have close. That's a good question. We don't have close tabs on all the freelance musicians who, if, if you like, are part of our extended family. And that's why I want us to engage with them as much as possible. As far as I can tell, so far, it's still hanging together. But how long it could continue that way, I'm not sure. Yeah, absolutely. I noticed that one of the requests and the recommendations that you have is to ensure that the arts sector is supported and given clarity in the continuing lifting of lockdown measures, including a timetable for lifting of restrictions and mass gatherings. Um, I know that there's a Northern Ireland match on tonight where people would love to go to that. It's, it's something we all would love to see, but unfortunately COVID doesn't say we're going to finish this on the, at the end of November. Um, but. I think from a, a societal point of view and for a mental health issue is that you've already talked about how much you work. Um, we do need to see people being able to get back together again safely. Um, so as soon as as soon as that can happen, of course, that's really important. Um, but I'm just there's one of the other questions you'd mentioned there about um, venues and you know social distancing within venues will of course have an impact on the number of audiences that can come to see you. Um, are you able to get support from, say, for instance, a health and safety executive, or who's helping yourselves with, um, for instance, the Ulster Hall, and, and how that will have to change internally as a venue to allow an audience to come back? Yeah, we work closely with the, the hall management, uh, largely, and we do our own, for, just as an aside, we have gone very hard on COVID protocols within the organisation because... As you can imagine, an orchestra, if we lose one person to COVID, we lose probably the whole orchestra. So we have very, very strict protocols around our own organisation. So we've also taken that on with on board with what we would propose with audiences, hence this idea of just very low numbers to begin with. But uh, yes, the combination of what you just described, working with the hall and our own very strict protocols around uh, distancing. Thank you very much. Please pass on um, my appreciation and thanks to, to not only the orchestra, but all of those people who work in the background to make um, all performances happen. Um, we, we often forget about those people who, you know, put forward the sound equipment or people who drive the lorries to transport the bus drivers that take people. Um, and, and they're absolutely key. But um, as soon as we can get more freedoms, um, I'm looking forward to some performances. Um, but thank you very much. Please do pass on my thanks. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Kelly. Okay, thank you. Can I then bring in Mark? There. Thanks, Chair, and, and thanks for that uh, presentation again. Uh, a lot of the issues have been uh, touched on. It was heartening to, to, to hear, I suppose, the amount of engagement there has been from Ulster Orchestra, not just over the, the COVID period, but predating that in terms of community outreach and, and, and get into those areas where one wouldn't expect necessarily to, to find uh, classical music or, or an appetite f for it. I'm aware of the, the schools project that had, it was done in my own uh, constituency and have seen and, and heard some of the fruits of it. Given the increased online activity and the opportunities outlined there are touch, touched upon at least of expanding your audience, now, I, I know we'll see things like on the death of Ennio Morricone, uh, an Ulster Orchestra rendition of Gabriel's Oboe went viral. I know yesterday there was stuff from the Youth Orchestra, or maybe the day before, uh, being shared like mad around social media. Have you a way of, of tracking or capturing those people who are just newly engaging with, with your work so that whenever, I suppose, we get through all this and we are back up, 
in running in some degree of normality as as we knew it that you're you're able to to go after them and maybe bring them in to live performances as well it's such a good question i wish i'd asked that of my marketing team before i came out today so if you could bear with us i think we will we will source that information and and come back to you because it's a very very good thought and you're absolutely right we should know so if we could come back that would be good yeah it would be good to see another one would i suppose it would be in terms of your musicians and and members given the ongoing lockdown and despite the great efforts of yourselves and the online work that has been going on i know i've spoken to some musicians not not solely orchestra musicians but but people who play in, in, in bands or, or even some so- solo artists and they say nothing can uh, replicate or take the place of an actual live performance you know with their bandmates and, and with their uh, with a, a, an audience there is, is there any risk or have you heard anything from your musicians like where they're, they're looking elsewhere and seeing the grass maybe greener in terms of efforts being made to facilitate live performances or, or even places that have historically invested more in the arts? Yeah, I think I'd step out on a bit of a limb here because, but I, I have a feeling that people are looking to what we are doing with Envy. The fact yeah. that musicians, even though without audiences, can come and play every day with their colleagues, particularly when we get freelancers from other orchestras who are effectively locked down coming and say, this is amazing. You're actually playing together and we're not, you know, we haven't been together for six or eight months. So I think at the moment we, I would hope we are looked at it, we're looked at as, a, as an enviable place to be. And we certainly have some phenomenal uh, musicians. I mean, I mentioned Daniela Rustioni, but, you know, brand new principal cello who's world beating, fantastic. And these, mm-hmm. these, these people bring, they attract other great musicians. So at the moment, I would say we're in a very good place. Very, uh, very good uh, and i suppose finally in terms of us getting back to normal and, and back to live audience it's notable that much of your outreach work or a good proportion of it that you've outlined there is with and for the benefit of, of older and maybe some more more vulnerable people would it be fair to say that that cohort or, or, or that generation you know it, it also would generally comprise a large enough percentage of your live audiences when you are out uh, doing your bit, and would there be concerns, therefore, that whenever we do open up again and, and we all look for, forward to that, that there be a nervousness among that sector of the population about coming back to, to, to live performances? Yes, yes exactly. absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's a, it's a major concern. Okay, so so I mean, you could be keeping up the online end of things as well. I don't think that's anything that you want to be shutting down, given that it is a medium or a platform that you have adapted to so well and exploited in the good sense of the word uh, to your advantage. Yeah, I, th- I think that's right, and and the plan for us is to have a hybrid uh, way of working, so the live performances, as you'd recall from. Guildhall in Derry or the Ulster yeah. Hall in Belfast, but they, they, they are filmed and could be repackaged uh, mm-hmm. in some way. So I think, yeah, you're absolutely right. Digital is here to stay. Okay. Well, super. Thank you, folks, and good luck. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mark. I have no other members who have um, ad- uh, indicated that they want to ask anything further. So can I just then finish by saying a big thank you? Um, to you for coming in today and for briefing us. Um, I'm sorry we couldn't get you in any sooner, but I'm glad that we have got you in. It has really um, opened my eyes as well, and I hope for other people that are maybe watching this, um, just to, at the, the vast array of work that the Ulster Orchestra does. And, and I look forward um, to that time where I can come in and, um, <coughs> and listen. Um, I, I've, I've, I've been to a few concerts and uh, thoroughly enjoyed them so I look forward to, to that day whenever we can get back to that again and thank you again, thank you for coming in and we will, um, as a committee we will um, uh, certainly on your behalf write and ask about the tax relief and, and bring up the issues that you have you've identified ok we're very grateful, thank, thank, you. thank you very much thank you so much, thank bye you. bye 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 thank you <clears throat> Okay, members, members agreed with that then, that we then write and, and ask about those issues that were raised by the orchestra today around the yep. tax relief? Sure yes. Enough. Okay.
Chair, can I maybe ask, there is one of the, the points that's raised there about a long-term strategy for survival and aid, stability or sustainability within the arts sector. Um, I appreciate the Minister is doing a lot of um, social inclusion um, strategies or social strategies, sorry. Um, I'm just wondering, could we ask for, um, you know, what is the longer term plan for the arts? Um, obviously, we're in crisis mode at the moment, um, but... You know, the arts and so many of those organisations have provided relief throughout COVID and they're in their knees now. Um, but the long term strategy, um, it would be good just to know how the department's thinking about that. If, if they wanted to give us a written brief, I'm not asking for anything more. We're very busy with a lot of meetings, but even just an update on, on what the future plans are. Yeah, I think I agree with that. And I know that certainly other members, and I know Robin had brought that up as well about uh, getting that, that information from the Minister on a long-term strategy on many of the, the issues that this committee um, looks at. And you're quite right, we're more than happy to get a written brief on that because we know that, the, that um, time is tight for us and for the Minister. So I'm happy enough with that, members. If members are happy, we'll move on. OK, great. All right. Agreed. All right, then we're going to move on to uh, agenda item number eight, which is statutory rule. It's SR 2020-242, the Social Security Coronavirus Further Measures Amendment and Miscellaneous Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2020. OK, members, that's at page 20 of your pack. Can I then ask all members, has anybody any objection to this rule? No. no objections? All agreed? Agreed. Okay. Then I'll read that the Committee for Communities has considered SR 2020-242, the Social Security Coronavirus Further Measures Amendment and Miscellaneous Amendments Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to the Examiner of Strategy Rules Report, has no objection to this rule. Okay, members? Mm -hmm. Then we're moving on. I haven't missed anything out. Can I just ask? Because we went back and forward a bit. No, there. no, okay. you're great. Okay, <laughs> then we're going to move on to agenda item number nine, which is correspondence. And just before I go on to the correspondence memo, there was, I meant to bring it up in Chairperson's business. If members go to their table papers, I think it is on page two of your table papers. Um, I had received a letter around in relation to the musical instruments funding. Um, so I have... And they had said in it about the, this funding only had a 17-day turnaround and um, also about the amount of money as well, given that it's open to so much more than brands now. It's open to traditional groups and to individual musicians as well. <laughs> and it was just to, to highlight the fact of such a short turnaround for an important um, uh, piece or important issue for many bands. I also had a, 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 spoke to a friend who plays in a brass band who raised the issue up with me as well. Um, so it's just for they've asked if we can then ask the minister if this could be extended. Um, from what we've been, I've been led to believe, it's normally a four-week window when applying for um, this this type of grant funding. But that this one has been done just for 17 days, and plus we have the impact of COVID, where many of those constituted groups are not meeting on a regular basis for their practice or for for any of the of the meetings that they might be having. So I'm just asking members, would they be in agreement then if we can then contact the minister to ask that this, this gets a, a, an extension mm -hmm. um, of, of a period of time to allow those many, many groups and individuals um, that need to apply for this funding to be able to get a fair chance to mm -hmm. apply for funding? Are members in agreement with that? Sure. Sorry, Rob, sure, go I ahead. Do... Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think I would... Uh... I uh, absolutely agree with you, Chair. We do remember the occasion when we had Sport NI in, where we were dealing with uh, a very short window that was offered uh, for some grant uh, yes. application to, to sports teams. Uh, I, I do think, given the circumstances at the moment, given that regular meetings of organisations uh, right across the board are, are no longer taking place, that indeed it would be common sense to to allow an extension to this time, Chair, in order that uh, as many applications as we can get in or, or actually got in. I also Remember, we're not, we're not dealing with, by and large, we're not dealing with professional organisations, with staff. We're dealing with uh, voluntary organisations with... with uh, minimal resource time uh, available to them, Chair. Now, and I also note on the letter um, that they've stated that the Arts Council are, are under a great deal of pressure 
uh, with, with a range of, of COVID-19 funding bids, and we know that is the case. There are several bids that are up and live at the moment. So they've asked for a three-week extension. So I'm just asking members if they're in agreement that we send this on um, from the committee to the minister. Yes. Agreed, yeah. All agreed on agreed. that? Okay. Members, then I'm going to move us on to item nine. Which is, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Who's that? Just, Kate? I have no issue with the proposal. Just the line in the, the letter which says... Uh, finally, the amount of money allocated to the scheme by DFC is reduced in recent years from 200k to 120. Since more instrument funds are now being made available to traditional groups and individual artists, what does that mean? What, what does that mean? Since more instrument funds are now being made to traditional groups, I think it was just to say that I think in reading that myself, because I had to read that a couple of times too. I think in reading that myself is that they don't understand why the money has been reduced whenever the um, application process has been expanded, and they're happy, they're more than welcome that it is expanded. But why reduce the why reduce the amount of money if you're expanding it out to more um, people who can avail of the of the grant, which is good. We want to see as many people as possible avail of it. I think that's it, Sinead. Okay, I just what's the definition of traditional groups? It's just what what does that mean? It could be anything traditional groups. I don't know. I know we have a, a great traditional um, music group in in our Newton Abbey, and it is made up of um, various different instruments that are played in its traditional music. Whether that is Irish, um, Ulster Scots, or a mixture of both. Okay, it's just not very clear. Just to, no, that's okay. Well, I just I mean, want to get. We're we're not clear. asking. We're not asking for a definition of that off the minister. All we're asking is an extension to allow all of these groups and individuals um, to be able to apply for um, instruments. Okay, members. Yeah, no, yeah, no, no, no issue with that. Just it wasn't very. No, understand. Okay, I'm happy to move on. Yep. Yep, okay, we're going to move on then to our correspondence member. You'll find that at page 60 of your meeting pack. Um, I want to draw members' attention to uh, uh, an email that was sent through to myself. It's at page 403. Um, the letter from an individual is in relation to the governance of the IFA. The letter alleges criminality, and the individual has stated that the letter has been copied to the PSNI. Those aspects of the letter are a matter solely for the PSNI and not this committee. However, I will ask members, are they content to forward a copy of the letter to the department? They ask if it has any role in the governance of the IFA and to comment to the committee solely on the governance issues raised within the letters yeah, or within great. the letter. Can I first of all ask members in the room, are they content with that approach? Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Members on Starleaf, are you content with that approach? Content. Okay, thank you. I'm then going to. I have no other issues to bring up under correspondence, so I'm going to ask members first of all on Starleaf if you have any issues under correspondence you need to bring up. I'm content, sir. Sure. Okay, and in the room, any issues around the correspondence memo from anybody else? No. No. All right, that's good. We'll then move on to agenda item ten, which is our forward work program. Can I inform you that at the meeting on next week, the 19th of November, we will be briefed by the Cliff Edge Coalition on welfare reform mitigations. Then we'll have a briefing from Drumbo Park representatives on the licensing and registration of clubs amendments bill. And then the committee will take place or sorry, take part in effective questioning training um, after that committee next week. Any comments on that, Kelly? I was just going to ask, um, I know that the Minister is working away on the welfare mitigations, but there was there's supposed to be a review of the welfare mitigations. We haven't seen an update on that. It might be useful if we could get a hold of that before next week's meeting with the Cliff Edge Coalition, because they could be asking us, what are we doing about? And actually, the Minister's already looking at that, because um, there are issues. You know, Are we just welfare mitigations are what currently are in place or is there more being added or what's happening? So it would be useful maybe to ask the department if they could give us an update, just so we're not having to wait another week to find out what's happening. I think you're absolutely right. I think this committee, from its inception at the beginning of the year, has brought up the issue around welfare yeah. mitigations and the fact that we haven't had uh, those briefings or even to look at how the mitigations, how that would be managed for those. And we know that there has been massive amounts of money within the budget has been set aside for the next two years. For, uh, welfare mitigation, so I think that's right. We will ask that first of the minister, and it would be fair, and the department would be very useful to have that for next week. So thank you for bringing that up. 
Um, any other members on agenda item 10 want to make comment or are happy enough to move on? Yes? All good? Okay. We'll move on then to agenda item 11, which is any other business? Members in the room, any other business? Kelly? Yes, I was just wanting to ask, we, we received papers um, on the bids that are being requested by the, the department. Um, but to be honest, they're very welcome, fantastic. But there is an issue about the community and voluntary sector funding, and I think we should ask for a breakdown of how that has happened, because the sector itself thinks that there's an underspend of about £6 million yeah. that hasn't been allocated. It would just be useful from, from the committee's point of view to find out maybe for all of those COVID, but in particular the community and voluntary, and I say there's more money has been released today, which is wonderful, but if there is an underspend there, get it out as quickly as possible. I don't see any additional money being bid for, so if it is an underspend, maybe it's already been allocated elsewhere, but um, if we could just find out what's happening with that. Um, very grateful for the Minister for the work that she is doing, because to be honest, she gets it, and, and, and it's been very useful. But the recovery fund out today is one element. Um, there's the, the, what do you call it, the... Oh, you know the money that's sitting dorm uh, dormant accounts, dormant accounts yeah. and this supposed six million underspend. Where's that? Yeah, it's okay. just to see. What's I know in. the six million underspend. I'm almost certain we brought that up in committee about four or five weeks ago. Yeah. Because Nora had written through to the committee yeah. on our correspondence, so we definitely have that has been sent to the department. So that this is a follow up to ask why it's not included. Yeah. Then in any any bids or any you know why we aren't, haven't heard. Because um, it doesn't look like they're handing it back. No. No. Yeah. Sorry, Andy, you wanted to come in. Sure. Yes. Um, I, I've been following this issue quite closely, um, and I wrote to the minister uh, through a written question. Uh, and 8.8 .8 million, you're right, Cali ha had been allocated to it, uh, and I've also been speaking to Nora and CO3, uh, and they've indicated to me that there is 6.7 million under that hasn't been allocated just yet, and the department are looking at reopening that fund uh, before Christmas. Oh, well, that's oh, good, that's but that good. would be good if the committee could hear that as well. That there, you know, it needs to be more than a, an answer to a written question to a member. Yep. Yeah. No, that's good, Andy. Thanks for letting us know that. Thank you. All right, members, anything else under AOB? With members on Starleaf, anything? No. No? No. no. Okay, members, well, that was relatively painless today. Um, I'll move then on to agenda item 12, which is date, time and location of our next meeting. And that next week's meeting will take place on Thursday, the 19th of November at 9 a.m. You will, be, of course, get emails to remind you of that next week. So 9 a.m. next week in room 29. And I have just one more thing I want to say, and that's in relation to tonight, and that is Dirty Dream. So thank you, members. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Committee room 29.